Welcome to the Nicolera Show. This is the place where we explore big ideas with people having a big impact on our world. I'm your host, Nick Hilera, serial entrepreneur, author, early morning riser, and seeker of truth and wisdom. Join me as we explore the journeys and discoveries of fascinating people who are literally unlocking the secrets to creating a life of both success and fulfillment. Each episode will arm you with insights, ideas, and practical perspectives on what it takes not only to be financially and personally successful, but also how to start having authentic impact on the world around you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. What you're about to hear is my conversation with David Robbie, the founder and CEO of Tovala, a venture-backed company that's revolutionizing the food industry. David is someone I've known for years and have been watching pretty closely. I've been so impressed with how he's led Tovala through some pretty tumultuous times. In some sense, I'm not really surprised that he's developed into such a good leader. His father, an exceptional entrepreneur in his own right, has been an important business partner and mentor of mine and I'm sure has provided David a powerful example. One of the things I'm trying to do with this show is to examine just what good leadership really looks like. I had a feeling that this conversation would reveal just that, and it did not disappoint. David shines through here as an example of an exceptional leader. What you're going to see in this conversation is someone who not only has all the tangible business expertise that you'd want to see in a leader, like command over the details of the business, deep understanding of the competitive position, passion for the product and customer, but also the intangible marks of a great leader, like a hyper-focus on the team and its needs, psychological maturity, self-understanding, and perhaps most importantly, the willingness to be vulnerable. I think there's just a ton about leadership to learn from this engaging discussion. Hope you enjoy. We are welcoming today to the show my friend, uh, David Robbie. David is the founder and CEO of Tovala, which is what I consider to be one of the most interesting and I think arguably the most successful food tech company to come out in, in the last decade. So David, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nick. I figured uh, just for the benefit of our listeners who may, may or may not know the story of Tovala, maybe just give a brief like elevator summary of, of what your business is and, and what you're up to these days. Yeah. So uh, Tavala is a combined smart oven and chef prepared meal service. Our idea is really to take the best elements of home cooking. So the fresh raw ingredients, great tastes, different textures, beautiful sm- smells in your home and give you, give you that end result, <clears throat> but actually eliminate all the work that goes into getting that meal on the table and cleaning it up. And so We've really built an end-to-end solution where we are developing recipes, actually preparing food. It gets shipped to your doorstep. We've purpose-built our oven to cook your meals and then built a software layer that connects all those pieces so that you can put our meals, which are mostly raw ingredients, into the oven, scan a QR code, and 15 to 20 minutes later, you get a perfectly cooked home, home-cooked meal. And, and how big are you now? Like, What's the scale of this operation? So we, we are about 400 people. We're producing nearly 200,000 meals a week. Uh, and, and the business is at nine, nine figures of revenue. Nice. And are you, uh, is this all in, in the United States or are you doing anything international? Yeah, we're, we're just in the continental U.S. The, the business we think will play well internationally, but is pretty complex to move outside of the U.S. because we do manage all of our own food, uh, both, you know, procurement, preparation, distribution, all these things. You know, we don't actually handle the, the logistics, but everything else we do ourselves. And we have finally, I think, really mastered how to do it in the U.S. and now benefiting from a lot of that, those learnings and scale. And so to go do that in another country, we think is, is probably a five to 10 year exercise for us, uh, largely because the U.S. is so big. So we still have a ton of room to run here before we have to think about another market. Yeah, that makes sense. It seems to me like the, the regulatory landscape for providing food has got to be challenging, you know, not only here in the U S but in places like Europe, for example, like it's gotta be a real situation. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's super complicated here and we've been in market for almost six years and I think have a pretty good handle on it now and built a team that really understands it. And what we're doing in the grand scheme is still relatively new. Like we're shipping perishable food across the country that gets ordered online. Um, so some of the regulations were lagging and, uh, there was a lot of gray to sort through, especially in, in our early years. 
And, you know, there's federal regulations, state regulations, city regulations, like a lot of a lot of different things that we have to take into account. Um, so doing that somewhere else, you know, feels feels very challenging. Um, but at, at some point we will, I imagine. Yeah, just thinking about it, it's, it's like challenging. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, thank you for that. I think that this is a good summary. And I, I want to take it like back. I want to rewind the clock a little bit because I, I feel like it would be interesting to hear how you got interested in this food tech space in the first place. Yeah. So go back to when I was 18. Uh, I went on a health retreat with my dad and it was five or six days of vegetarian food and hiking and yoga and no, no electronics, no devices, uh, and really opened up my eyes to the power of healthy eating, exercise, wellness. And it was not something I'd ever really thought consciously about before that. Um, not that I was a, a bad eater, or, you know, I, I played sports and I was in decent shape, but it wasn't something I was kind of proactively thinking about leveraging as a way to improve my life and my well-being. And, and that retreat definitely changed my whole perspective on it. Went back to the retreat multiple times, ended up reading dozens of books on nutrition and health and wellness and trying lots of different diets, interning at a number of different food places. Um, and, and ended up spending the bulk of my career in food. And I think that was kind of the, the first seed of why food tech. And the second one was, you know, post getting into business school, I launched a mobile app as a side fund project. It was never intended to be a business, but it kind of picked up some steam. And I, I ended up meeting a lot of people in the tech space and having to get smarter about startups and the technology industry and venture capital and, and these things. And that was very exciting, too. And so I, I went to business school kind of thinking, hey, can I marry these two worlds before food tech was even necessarily a category? Um, now I think that it is a category. There's lots of news about it. It's its own industry. And that those two worlds had not come together. This is about a decade ago uh, in the way that they have today. But for me personally, they were, they were both kind of interesting passions. And I thought if I can find a way to bring them together, it would be really cool. Yeah, for sure. Hey guys, this is Nick. I wanted to take a quick break from the episode to share some exciting news. In addition to the podcast, I want to make you aware of some additional content we're putting out. And best of all, it's 100% free. Our Profit Plus newsletter consists of weekly insights about what it takes to find meaning in the pursuit of modern success. This is the place where we explore big ideas at the intersection of markets, business, politics, and life as we seek to empower our readers to have an authentic impact on the world. If you're serious about finding fulfillment amid success, then definitely check out these additional insights. Just go to subscribe.nickhilaris.com. Again, that's subscribe.nickhilaris.com. Now let's get back to the episode. I noticed uh, you know, that Tobala has an interesting mission, which I love, which is something along the lines of like, you know, making it easy for people to get good food. And I'm, I'm just like to hear the origin story of that as well. I mean, I, th I think I kind of have a sense of where it comes from, but let, let, let's hear it. Yeah, I, I think it it stems from you know personal goal of like helping people to eat better and and believing that home cooked food is a great way for us to experience eating. And um, you know, even if uh, you know the, the way we think about it is we're shipping people boxes of of food where the ingredients are mostly raw. And they're cooking from scratch perfectly. So, you know, we think that's that's the best way to eat. Um, and even though we're not necessarily like a health driven company, I do think that is an outcome for a lot of people that end up eating Tavala. They eat better, they feel better, um, and we feel very good about what we're doing as a company. Um, and you know, I think that's ultimately where it, it comes from. And and you know, that's like definitely part of the driving mission. But you know, another huge outcome of people that use Tavala is it's just a huge stress relief. You know whatever that stress manifests like for you, but getting dinner or lunch on the table multiple days, nights per week is really stressful for people. And so it might be that they're saving time or it's energy or it's time that they can go spend with their families. But at the end of the day, that's what Tavala really enables. Um, and those are the stories we hear from our customers. Yeah. You, your business is reaching people at like a pretty important and intimate place, right? It's, it's food. It's mm -hmm. their schedules. It's the logistics of the household. It's like, it's kind of a big deal um, when you think about right, it. Right, right. And, and the product gets used so much because it's, it's people cooking our food, but it's also people cooking their own food. And we try to make that easier as well. 
whether it's, you know, we've got recipes in our app and you can scan grocery products. So those cook automatically and there's a great reheat button. And so we do get very much like embedded in people's lives. Uh, and we're in, we're in, you know, what we think is the most valuable real estate in the home, like right smack dab on the kitchen countertop. Um, so we are. And, and the customers that love us, they love us. And we have a lot of them that just like want to spread the gospel of Tavala. Yeah, for sure. And when you were thinking about this business, you deliberately kind of thought through the strategy of actually providing both ends of it, like you mentioned a few seconds ago. So it's not just providing the food but it's also providing this device and marrying it together. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, where I started with that was really the problem to solve. And for me, it was how can you get all of those elements of the home cooked experience and actually take the work out of the end, out of the hands of the end consumer? And the only way I could wrap my head around doing that was like, well, if we're going to send people raw ingredients, someone has to cook them, something has to cook them. And we want to take that out of the hands of the 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 customer. So we're going to have to build the device to cook that food. But if the food is going to have to be made for the device, like probably we're not going to be able to find someone that's going to make us this like highly customized food offering that's then going to change every week that's designed just for cooking in this device. So I, I like could not wrap my head around how else this was going to work, at least out of the gates of like, we, we would have to control those two elements. And then we were going to have to connect, like, you, you know, if we were going to have a pretty dynamic menu that changed all the time, we were going to have to share that information with the device somehow. It's like, okay, cool. This week there's a miso glazed salmon with broccoli, but next week it's a Chilean salmon with potato wedges. Those are going to cook very differently. And so the device had to be Wi-Fi connected. And so then there had to be this firmware and software layer that kind of connected the food side of the business to the hardware side of the business so that you could constantly update what kind of recipes we were cooking uh, uh, you know, on, on the platform. So it really, from the very beginning, was this kind of closed ecosystem around our meals. But the device has always been open. So, like, we, we always encourage people to use the device to cook their own food, too. Philosophically, that was, you know, one of the drivers. And then secondly, it helps to get the space on the countertop. Like, knowing that you can use the device for your own food helps justify the purchase up front. And it helps keep it on the countertop. Like, you might get tired of our meals or maybe there's a change in your household or something like that. We want you to keep the Tavala on your countertop and, you know, continue using it and getting joy out of it. Yeah, for sure. How many different iterations have, have there been of the oven now? We've had about, I'd say, two and a half. Uh, so we had, we had a very clear first generation and then a clear second generation. First generation launched uh, mid-2017, second gen, Q4 of 18. And then we launched an iteration on the second gen more recently, about a couple months ago, um, That that's got a you know, better air fryer, slightly different color. So it's a, it's a stone gray instead of a black mat. Um, and, and it's positioned as kind of our, our good oven. And then the, the, the steam oven is kind of the better oven. So that's, that's how we've decided to position them in the market, but they're not dramatically different, the two of them. That makes sense. Let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. This episode of the Nick Hilera show is brought to you by Metro's Capital. If you're an investor looking for direct access to real estate investments, then we'd love to talk with you. Investment opportunities at Metro's Capital balance financial returns and community impact. To learn more, contact us at metros.nickhilaris.com. Again, that's metros.nickhilaris.com. Now let's get back to the episode. What's the vision inside of, of Tavala? Like, how far can these this smart technology go and on, on what time frame? Is it going to be like the Jetsons or like, what's the, what's the future look like in this space? Yeah, it's a good question. We, we think the business that, you know, people see today can get significantly larger, uh, you know, 10 to 50 X, frankly, the size that it is today based on how big the, that we think the market is and, you know, the, the competitive landscape that we see. So, you know, I'd say not a ton of difference in the kind of near to medium term, like probably some distribution differences. Eventually you'll see Tavala in retail, which we think will be really cool. Um, and then obviously like a lot more investment and awareness. But then if we look kind of beyond that. Uh, one thing we're investing in pretty heavily is, you know, essentially how do you extend the platform on, on both sides? So on the food side and on the hardware side. So on the food side, this is actually starting. It's happened already and growing pretty quickly, but we're now selling third-party food through our platform that's designed to cook automatically in the Tavala. So We've got enough scale now that we can go to other direct-to-consumer companies that are making food that's designed for an oven. So that these could be, you know, brownies, 
deep dish pizza, thin crust pizza, baguettes, croissants, like pies, all, all kinds of different products that we will probably never make ourselves, um, that other companies are great at making, maybe have good brands around. We work with those R&D teams. They already have the product. We just develop the instructions for cooking it in the oven and supply them with a QR code or PC code or something like that. And, and then we sell it through our app and our website. And then the, the, the third party companies go out and, and ship it themselves. So for our customers, all of a sudden, there's like a huge amount of new variety that they can access through the Tavala platform. For the partners, it's free customer acquisition. And then for us, we get extra revenue, you know, very different margin profile and, and much lower capex to scale that line of the business. So we're very bullish on that. It's our marketplace. We think, you know, it will start to make up a bigger and bigger part of our revenue as we look out two, three, four, five years. And then we, we probably see a similar dynamic at play on the hardware side. The, the, you know, that will take a lot longer time, but we've talked to many appliance companies that are very interested in basically embedding our technology into their connected ovens and enabling their ovens to cook everything on our food platform. So our Tavala meals, the marketplace, um, you know, some of the scan to cook grocery products that we have. And that really just builds the, the base of customers that we can go sell food product to. So. We're uniquely positioned for both of these things. We're really the only company in the world that understands ovens, food for ovens, and software for ovens inside out. And so kind of companies on both sides of the hardware and food side of the business want to work with us. Um, and we think that will be a part of the future over time. But but I'd say the near-in one is the marketplace. That's probably like the the major kind of new thing that we're doing. That's cool. Yeah, that, I mean, that seems like a humongous opportunity. Just thinking about like all the different... You walk through the grocery store, all the different things that could potentially fit that bucket. It's it's a huge, right. yeah, right. huge number. Right, right, yeah. And and as we get more and more density, we can start to do things in grocery and in retail in terms of food. Whether it's selling our own food product or partnering with grocers to sell, you know, some of their product that works on the Tavala. But we do think some pretty cool things get unlocked as we have more and more Tavalas in people's homes in, in dense cities. Yeah. One of the things I've been thinking about recently, which this conversation just brought in my mind is, so we have these sort of, they're not Tavala ovens, but they're you know, relatively new products from Miel. And one of them just went bad, like it had a tech issue and we couldn't, uh, we couldn't cook or do anything for like a week. And yeah. it's, you know, you got to call yeah. somebody. So like, how, how are you all handling this, that particular issue, which is becoming more and more of a thing, like pretty soon that's going to be how cars work too. You're going to be calling some tech support company to get your car fixed rather than going to the shop. But how, what's been going on with, with your stuff? Yeah, it really depends on the issue. There's a fair number of stuff that we can solve remotely, which is pretty cool. And, you know, because the ovens are Wi-Fi connected, we, we can do fairly live diagnostics on what's actually happening with the device. Um, so it's a pretty unique advantage, especially if, you know, we find something weird happening out in the field, we can diagnose and often solve without ever going into someone's home. Um, so it's it's pretty awesome from like a customer experience, but also cost saving standpoint. And then obviously, sometimes there's stuff that just is like mechanically broken with the devices. It, it happens pretty infrequently, like our exchange rates are pretty low. Um, but because of the nature of our business model, if people are ordering food, like we will just send them an oven if, if their oven is broken. Uh, we want people continuing to order food from us. That makes sense. Yeah, it's once you have a, a loyal customer and you do whatever it takes, basically. Right. Makes sense. Right. Um, we, we touched briefly on uh, the competitive landscape kind of in our conversation before we hit the record button. But I, I think it would be good uh, to revisit some of that because... As you mentioned earlier, like this was a space that really is only like a decade old. Like nobody was talking about food tech uh, until the last ten years. And there's been some pretty high-profile companies, both you know successful and, and not successful. Uh, like Blue, I'm, I'm thinking of a couple of things. Like you have Blue Apron, which you know famously got super popular and even IPO'd, and you had another one who was raised a ton of venture money but just ultimately failed pretty dramatically, which was like a juice company. I forget the name of it. But they had a yeah, juice. Yeah, they had a juice device. So, what, what does the competitive landscape look like today in this world, and, and how do you see it evolving? Yeah, it's been a it's been a pretty crazy ten years, as you allude to. Um, yeah, today we're at an interesting point. There's been some consolidation on the meal kit side. Uh, I think there will be more. HelloFresh is kind of the runaway winner. It's a seven billion dollar revenue business, um, global footprint, 
uh, you know, EBITDA positive and has been for a couple of years uh, and clear continued growth plan. So they've done very well. You know, the market has really not rewarded them, I would say, from a, a market cap standpoint for a whole host of reasons that I think, you know, some have to do with HelloFresh, but more are, you know, things like Blue Apron has definitely put a stain on the, the kind of broader D to C subscription space, specifically food, but even beyond food. I think Blue Apron, unfortunately, was like the poster child for a company that did not work out uh, and had insanely high expectations. Um, and then, you know, on, on the food delivery side, that's kind of the other piece that has grown really significantly over the last five, six, seven years. Um, you know, and I think also there are like challenges around proving profitability. So the jury's still kind of out. And, you know, kind of the last thing you touched on, Juicero obviously didn't work out. They raised a ton of money from top tier venture capital funds. There's a lot of companies that have tried similar models to us of taking a physical device and selling some sort of consumable with it, whether it's wine or frozen yogurt or beer or fresh, fresh juice or smoothies. And most have failed, um, I, th I think, for a number of reasons. Like it is a very it's very complex to, to essentially do two radically different businesses under one roof and figure out you know, how to run it operationally, how to market it, price it, get customers, build you know, good unit economics. Um, and all, all of them have generally been modeled after Keurig and Nespresso, which did it so well in coffee. Uh, but I think every kind of variation of it has its own set of quirks and challenges that you know, maybe are not quite the same as coffee. And, and both, obviously, Keurig and Nespresso were super well-run companies. Um, but there's not a lot of you know, physical hardware plus consumable startups or late stage companies out there still. I think we're, we're one of the few that has really proven the model works really well. Uh, and for better or for worse, I think funding has really dried up. So right. I think, you know, get people coming up with these ideas now, it's just, it's harder to get funding for them, um, especially in the later stages. And HelloFresh, are, th are they the same model as Blue Apron or is it different? Very similar, very yeah. similar. So, you know, they, they, especially in their early days, their first four or five years, it was exactly the same. So meal kits, send it to your doorstep, you cook the food yourself. As HelloFresh has grown, they've been fairly acquisitive. So they've bought some fully prepared food companies where you just throw the meal in the microwave um, and, you know, built some kind of sub brands of meal kits that are higher end or lower end. But yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting story of, of one company that executed incredibly well and another company that didn't execute super well. And it, you know, brass tacks, like the, the actual products were not that different. Right. Um, and, and one is, like I said, 7 billion in revenue. The other is, 300, 350 in revenue, but 20, 30 million dollar market cap. So dramatic difference in, in outcome. And then the, the food delivery. One, one thing I've noticed, and, and this may be a function of like just the broader reality around these venture back companies, is that if you try to use the food delivery stuff these days, now that some of these companies have IPO, it's actually expensive. Like you order DoorDash in expensive. LA and it's like, wait, what, what am I paying? I don't get this. Um, but they're trying yeah. to make money. So the, the game is up now that they're public. They got to make profits. Yeah. But. Yeah. The sa same thing was true with Uber and Lyft. Like once they had to make a profit, all of a sudden the, it wasn't this amazing customer deal value proposition from a, a cost standpoint. I think, you know, the, the experience and the convenience is still true. But we with DoorDash, we think it's a huge opportunity for us because we have a very different business model. We're, we're packaging six, seven, eight meals at once that we're shipping from one central facility where the unit economics are awesome. And so we, we can't afford to charge a you know relatively very good price relative to what someone is paying DoorDash on a on a nightly basis. And so we think especially for recession hits and hits hard and people are thinking about where are they allocating their their discretionary spend around food, like we we think it's a big opportunity for us to go capture people that are still very convenient oriented, but don't want to spend 25, 30 bucks a person on, on food delivery every night. Yeah. Or even like, I, I've noticed even like this, this may be a function of inflation and I, I want to get your take on how inflation's played out for you. But even like going to like these fast casual places around town, the prices have gone up by a lot. And, and are you seeing the same yeah. thing on like the raw materials side for the inputs for your, for your goods? Like how, what's it been like with, for you guys? Yeah. Inflation was relentless for like, probably 18 months or so across really every cost center that we have. And for a long time, we just ate that and we didn't push price onto our customers. And we, we found other places to 
just counteract what we were losing on costs, like with some margin wins here and there. And then eventually it was unsustainable. So we, we raised price on our meals by a dollar in, I think it was Q2 of last year. Um, we had gradually added some shipping fees, uh, but had legacied in older customers. And so, yeah, we pushed price by a buck, um, I think a lot less than, than other companies have. And that that brought us like almost in line with where food inflation trends were. And I think we're still probably a little below what, what the actual kind of cost of inflation is. I, I think there's a lot of companies that have just taken advantage that maybe they've pushed too hard and it will ultimately hurt them from a customer retention standpoint. But yeah, it's, it's happening across the industry. Interestingly, like we saw very little hit to our overall customer retention. Um, you know, it was a very small drop when we raised price, but since then, you know, behavior hasn't really changed that much. And, and that, what percentage was that? So you said it was a dollar. It was a dollar. So we went from eleven ninety nine to twelve ninety nine as our base price. Okay. So less, so like eight eight yeah, percent. Pretty so. small in, in light of because I feel yeah. like food, like raw materials, had to be more than that, right? Yeah, depending on which raw materials, but yeah, man, many of them were more than that. It's also kind of stabilized, and some of them have come back down over the last quarter or two. Um, you know, certain certain larger commodity products prices have come down. And is it one of those spaces where you actually, if you're the buyer of those, you have, you're actually going to see the price decline, or are people like holding on to the old price for dear life and and you never see it? No, we've seen we've seen costs come down. We've definitely seen costs come down. Uh, you know, on our bigger ticket like proteins that we purchase, costs have definitely come down. Okay, so that's kind of encouraging. I think. Like, what are you, what are yeah. you seeing today? Like. Is the is inflation gone in your space, or is it still there but just less? No, we, I mean, in most of what we're seeing, like we prices are coming down. Um, so you know, I think the the rate hikes are having an impact for sure. We're we're seeing it. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, yeah, we we model we modeled that it was going to continue to go up, like just to be conservative and build some contingency around that, but we've, we've seen the opposite behavior. I feel like, yeah, it reached this absurd point and financial conditions have tightened so much that the unemployment data isn't like suggesting that like there's a bunch of people that are struggling, but I feel like there are and, and it's playing out already. And that's why we're seeing these prices come down. Yeah, I think there's just like a lot of, I think a lot of lag between rates going up and like feeling that impact in the day-to-day -day economy. I think it will take many months. Like th there's still some kind of, I don't know, discongruence between rates going up and prices going up so much, but unemployment being really low, consumer spending still being high, like something feels a little off. Um, we, we haven't really seen much of a slowdown in demand. But again, we actually think like if more people get laid off and there is a recession, like might actually be an opportunity for us to lean in on a on the more value side of things. Um, so we're prepared if that happens. Yeah, because your price per meal is like on the low end of the competitive landscape. Yeah, like and and we've got we've got a line of meals that are sub ten dollars, and so you know we, we will lean more heavily into that um, should that kind of be the right call from a macro standpoint. That makes sense. Um, another thing I've been thinking about, I've been wanting to ask you, you all have made the, the choice early on to manufacture the actual technology, the oven in China. Are you still doing that? And what, how's it been like operating in China in this sort of uh, crazy COVID time, but also a crazy anti-China trade time? How has that impacted yeah. your business? And what do you, how do you see the future plan out? Yeah, the, the reality is for a product like ours, there's, almost nowhere else we could go to manufacture it at reasonable cost. Um, for countertop uh, appliances, China owns the market. And so, you know, there's a, there's a small market in Turkey, um, and then you, you can find one-off suppliers here and there across the world, but true industry for this is monopolized by China. And even if you're going to find a manufacturer in another part of the world, they're going to source a bulk of the, the actual parts from China. So really hard to escape that is the truth. And so there really was no decision early on. Um, and, you know, we still do all of the R&D ourselves um, and support kind of the, the firmware locally here or domestically rather in the U.S. But it was it was obvious we were going to go to China from the beginning. And, you know, the last three years have been chaotic, like 
we used to go to China for every single production build of our ovens and then didn't go for two and a half years. Um, and that would have been unheard of pre COVID and we just adapted and, and it ended up being generally okay. Um, and you know, from 20 Q1 of 2020 until probably like Q2 of 22, our hardware team was just focused on staying, keeping our product in inventory. Like that was it. There was no time, like we're a pretty lean group, but there was no time for cost projects, quality projects. It was just, how do we maintain inventory? And what, what do we have to do? What parts do we have to sub out? What design changes do we have to make to our circuit boards just to, to find the right parts that are available? What are the secondary markets for parts? Um, you know, lead times on some things got up to a year, year and a half, where before they were 8, 10, 12 weeks. So pretty insane. Shipping costs went through the roof. There were all the issues at the ports. Like we had to deal with all that stuff. Um, so there's a ton of chaos internally for us, tariffs. Uh, and, you know, but then at the end of the day, like for consumers, uh, we really had very few back order periods. There was, you know, one stretch at the beginning of 22 where we were back ordered for like a two and a half week period. Um, and that was the longest we had. Asi- aside from that, it was, it was fine. And, and frankly, like we've been working with the same oven partner, oven manufacturing partner in China for five years and like built an, a great relationship with them. They've been amazing partners to us to the point where they were sending us PP&E early Q2 of, of 2020, knowing we ran our own food facilities and getting masks and things like that in the U.S. at that point was impossible. And they're like, hey, we got we have a lot of these. You're going to need them. They sent them to us. So um, from a kind of personal standpoint, that's been a really good relationship. Yeah, that's interesting. And uh, has anyone attempted to do this business model in China yet? Not that we're aware of. Um, I think it comes back to the complexity of what we're doing. Like we, we have continued to say that is the real moat here. And I think now there's six and a half, seven years of data suggesting that because, you know, so, so many of our numbers are best in class. You, you would imagine that there would be a lot of competitors rushing in to do the same thing, but it's very complex to do the, the hardware and the food and connect those pieces and figure out the distribution and logistics and continued creation of new recipes. And it's a lot of different things that have to work hand in hand. Um, and so established players that are in, you know, either the food space or the oven space don't have the domain expertise of the other space to do it themselves. So it would really have to be another startup. Uh, and we, we haven't seen that in, in China. In China. And are you going to continue? It sounds like the, the plan is to continue to work with China, right? The, the, man, the company in China. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. That is the plan. Yeah. And what do you think, like just zooming out, like from your experience, it sounds like you've had a positive experience working with with uh, counterparts in China. Like, what do you think of this narrative that's out there about, you know, China being a difficult place to do business going forward and the reshuffling of supply chains and all that stuff? I mean, we haven't felt that. I, you know, I don't know if that's unique to the product we're building or the partners that we've had. Like, obviously, there's all kinds of cultural challenges with working with any other country. I, I don't know that that's necessarily China, China specific. And I'm sure they feel the same way working with us here in the U.S. that we've kind of learned to work through. And our team has a lot of experience working in China. Um, but they've been great partners to us, you know, so we read stuff in the news and that that is not necessarily our story. Yeah, it's interesting. It's always so. I, always it's, interesting. You know, it's, frust- it's frustrating. Like, yeah, we're yeah. we're on the ground. Like we live it, and it's it's like it's frustrating and you know sometimes upsetting to see some of the stuff that's said and like some of the political moves that are being made. Um, and you know every every country has their own interests, obviously, but uh, our our partnership has been a very good one. That's great. Um, I wanted to switch gears for a second. Um, before I forget, and ask you about the food supply chain in general, because it's it's something that I've been fascinated about for a long time. Because, quite frankly, I sat next to somebody on an airplane. I was coming home from Argentina, and I sat next to someone who was describing to me some of the sort of business practices in the meat industry, and I was like, "Oh man, it really scared me in in a, in a bad way." You know, I was like, "God, I can't believe we're doing this this to animals, and this is how people are getting their food." But You've been in the trenches of the food supply chain, and I'm just curious to get your take. Like, what what is the truth, and what do you what scares you? What doesn't scare you? This might be a longer conversation. Yeah, 
Yeah, we're we're not so upstream as to be, you know, handling animals and and butchering animals and things like that. So I can't I can't speak to that end of it super well by any means. We we work with a lot of protein suppliers, obviously, but we're getting kind of finished, pre-packed, uncooked uh, raw proteins um, that are vacuum sealed. But um, yeah, I mean, we're we're definitely like an aggregator of sorts. So we work with all kinds of different suppliers, whether it's produce suppliers, protein suppliers, grain suppliers, you know, broader commodity suppliers. Um, and, and, you know, I think COVID showed like a lot of cracks in the chain on, on the supply chain side and um, how in many ways it was like, you know, on, on the protein side, especially, but even in some of the other commodities, like, optimized to such a hilt where like a little break in the chain and all of a sudden the whole thing kind of falls apart. Um, and so we had to be very dynamic with the kinds of foods that we were willing to put on our menus and, and sell during all of 2020, basically, um, because there was so much disruption to the supply chain. And the U S government has, has put, you know, I think it's a trillion dollars or $1.5 trillion, like a huge amount of money um, towards shoring up the food supply chain here. And, and some of that is in the form of tax credits. I think they're investing a lot of money. And, you know, if you have a business that is like furthering the domestication and I think securitization of the U.S. supply, U.S. food supply chain, there's capital there from the government to help you do it, I think, because they identified like, hey, this is this is a huge issue here. I see. So like your experience with it is more is farther down the chain, like you're not. Yeah. Yes. Worried about you know how milk is being pasteurized or the the different things that people write about when they talk about food issues in this country. Correct. We're further down the chain. We'll feel the impact of certain things like the avian flu, you know, hugely impactful to our business at the end of the day, but not something we're dealing with on the ground. And do you have like teams of people who source this and, and do quality control? Like, how do you handle that? Yeah, we've got a procurement team. Um, that is small but mighty and uh, focused on, you know, some of our procurement team is just like procure the base ingredients we need every week to keep in stock. And then, you know, there's more strategic procurement around, all right, what are the kind of the, the biggest ticket items where we're spending tons of money every year? How do we dual source, triple source? How do we find better pricing? How do we find higher quality? We're adding a lot of new proteins to our menu. So how do we go source different kinds of fish and beef and things like that. Um, so there's a whole procurement team and strategy on the food side and then separately on the oven side as well, which is smaller, but, but the, you know, there's, there's people focused on that and then with, within each facility and then, you know, kind of reporting up to someone on, on the corporate team, we've got a whole FSQA team that their whole job is ensuring food safety and quality of the food that goes out the door for us, which is an area we've invested a lot in. Like at the end of the day, we're, we're feeding people. And so, you know, the safety and quality of that food is imperative um, and not something we're willing to compromise on. So there's lots of people in each facility whose singular job is just, you know, watching out for safety and, and quality issues. Yeah. And, and that amounts to like testing for like bacteria and different things that could. Yeah, that's a big part of microbial testing is a huge part of us developing meals and shelf life testing and then, you know, inspecting boxes as they come down the line, inspecting ingredients when they come in the door to make sure they look OK all kinds of things like that. Yeah. Um, on a related uh, note, like what, what's your personal take or what is the, the company take, depending how you want to answer it on uh, the alternative meat space, the lab grown meat, like this other it's food tech. So it's kind of an adjacent business. Right. It's not really your business, but I'm just right. curious, you know, what you think about it. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about alternative protein first. I tip like one, this is my personal take. I think, from an investor standpoint, it's just so interesting when you zoom out to see like the herd mentality behind different trends. And it, you know, it's endemic, like every year, there's probably one or two trends or every couple years that just become the thing. And everyone is just pouring money in. And for a period of time, it was alternative proteins. And like you had a huge winner in Beyond Meat that returned, you know, crazy amounts of money to their investors and Impossible did super well as well. And you know, then all of a sudden there's all these upstarts that were like, hey, we can do it better. We're going to do fish and we're going to do pork and chicken breast and, you know, we'll be cleaner, whatever it is, whatever the angle was. And all these companies got funded. So then there were even more companies. And then all of a sudden, you know, Beyond Stock came down, 
it seemed like there was this huge overabundance of alternative protein startups. And now it's like none of them can get funded anymore. Um, and it's like zero to 60 and then back down to zero all of a sudden. It's like, uh, I, I find it kind of humorous because, uh, you know, like to me, to be a successful investor, you have to go against the grain, not, not with it. Um, but I think alternative proteins are a good example of how most investors are wired in our space for better, or for worse. So from a consumer standpoint, like it's interesting. I, I personally don't think that the alternative proteins I've tried are a, a good proxy for real protein. Not yet. Um, and I think you, we saw that in kind of overall usage. I think there was a novelty factor and then it fell. And I think the, the bulk of people eating alternative proteins tend to be more vegetarian, vegan at the end of the day. I, I don't know that they've actually captured carnivores, you know, or omnivores in a way that they were promising two, three, four years ago. Um, they might get there. Like, I think the products still have to improve really significantly for that to happen. I, you know, when we look at the Tavala customer base, there is not like a huge yearning for us to add alternative proteins. There's definitely like a small vocal minority. And our customer base is a pretty good reflection of the whole U.S. population. When we when we cut it by demographics, by income, by geography, um, it's it's pretty close to the U.S. population. So I feel like it's a good proxy for how these kinds of things are trending. Um, so we don't we actually don't have alternative protein on our menu. It's it's something we're thinking about this year. Now that we've built, you know, the ability to to customize multiple proteins on a dish, it's a little easier for us to add alternative protein and not take away from you know, a, a regular protein. Um, that's how I, I think about that from a, uh, cell-based meat. Like I, I don't have strong thoughts yet. I haven't tried one. Um, I think that, that, that to me is, is probably purely capital. Like if there's enough money for them to get far enough along that they can get their costs down to the point where it's close to parity with, uh, you know, pasture raised animals, like it's probably a really good thing for society and, and for global warming. Okay, so the, the reason it would be good is because it would be positive for global warming. That's my yeah. take. Like, I think it just like you know takes way more energy, way way more energy to like in theory like raise a cow than it would to grow cell grow grow meat in a plant. Um, and there's proxies for you know I think in biotech where this has been done and costs have come down pretty significantly. So it's definitely possible, but I think costs now are are extremely high compared to what it would cost. Uh, you know, to buy um, a piece of meat at the grocery store. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done. Yeah. To me, it's a fascinating space because I don't remember the numbers offhand, but I've, I've looked from time to time at like the numbers around the animals consumption. And it's mm -hmm. wild. Like if it's in the billions, crazy. I don't even know. How, look, for yeah, chickens in particular, right? It's like in the billions. Crazy. And fish, fish yeah, has to be crazy. Yeah. Yeah, and, and cows in particular is like one of the single worst things for the environment. Yeah. Um, another, I guess, another thought experiment would be like, okay, well, let's say they do figure it out. Let's say enough capital comes into this space. What does that mean for all these animals? Because these are huge yeah, herds right. of animals, or and, yeah, that's another question. Yeah, because they're not going to just stop living and breeding. I guess. I guess we're kind of forcing. <laughs> well, yeah, I think. I think a lot of them are for, you know, better or worse, like factory grown and factory farmed. And like, I think it would, you know, capitalism would go to work and like those farms would get smaller over time if, if it actually was like a, you know, lesser product, whether from a cost or quality standpoint. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I wanted to switch gears now because, uh, you know, I've been watching from afar, I'm, you know, full disclosure to the audience. I'm a small investor in, uh, the wallet, me and my partner, John Young, invested in the early days and, uh, you know, been watching you lead this company for years and then been very impressed. You know, you've handled yourself, you know, uh, beyond your years and, and have done some, have had phenomenal success and have done things what I consider in the right way. And one of my hypotheses, yeah, one of my hypotheses for the show is that I do think there's like, there's benefits that come from handling yourself the right way even though like some of these other ways maybe you, you know you get rich quick or something like that but like you really have to stick stick to it and i wanted to start talking to you about what it's been like to lead a venture back company in some crazy times like just to summarize the times we had like the go-go era of vc pre-covid 
Then we had COVID. Then we had this absolute crazy bubble, whatever you want to call it. And now yeah. it's like nuclear winter. And here you are, <laughs> you know, doing a you know capital intensive business and keeping it alive. And now, you know, I understand you guys are a profitable company already. It's pretty incredible. So I don't know where you want to start in that, but you know, what's it been like to to operate this company in that environment? Yeah, it's a it's a loaded question. Uh, I've been doing this for almost eight years, or I guess eight years, and sometimes it feels like it's been you know six months, and sometimes it feels like it's been fifty years. Uh, we've lived like many lifetimes running this company and, um, you know, I'm, I, I love learning and personal growth. And I think that is the benefit of my job is I've had to grow and learn like a crazy amount, uh, that I, I don't know would have been replicable in, in really any other role. Um, and I think that's a function of being venture backed and growing the way we did. And, and, you know, as a startup, like, you're in survival mode almost perpetually. I don't. I don't know when we will get out of that. Maybe that's when we've had a few years of profitability behind us. Um, but being in survival mode and having multiple, like truly existential crises, um, is an amazing opportunity for growth. In hindsight, in in the middle of it, it's horrendous. <laughs> but in hindsight, uh, you know, it's allowed me to grow a ton as a person and as a leader. Um, and I, you know, one of our values at Tavala is em embracing the obstacles. And I think, you know, some of it has happened to many startups in the space. Some of our challenges have been uniquely uh, Tavala. And as a company, often that's actually when we are at our best is when there's a huge crisis in front of us or a huge, huge obstacle in front of us. And that has very much become part of company lore now of like, well, you know, there was this one time when this happened and the company had three weeks of runway or this other time when, you know, this disaster happened and somehow they found a way, they found a way, they found a way. Like that is, that is who we are. I'd say that's like probably one of the deepest truths about our culture. Um, and, and I think it starts with leadership, like our whole executive team really since the start of this company has always been very strong in crisis and um, I think kept a very level head and, and operated rationally in times when, when things are crazy. And, and we've had a lot of those situations in the last several years, whether it was COVID or the SVB crisis, or, you know, as you said, nuclear winter, and then, you know, some things that were very specific to us that have happened that were very, very challenging to overcome. Um, we've done a good job getting through it. And I, I personally have learned a ton about myself, my own leadership style and, you know, my flaws, my strengths. Um, but, you know, a lot of it, I think, comes from upbringing and I've been a, a student of business my whole life. Like I've always wanted to start a company as far back as I can remember. So I, you know, devoured books of other business people. And I think had formed like some sense of my leadership style before we started the company. Uh, and a lot of the ways I lead the company are, are just kind of intuitive and instinctive. Um, and a lot of it I think has, has worked really well. I'm, I, I am like very transparent as a leader and very trusting. Uh, and I've, I've found that style has been, you know, it's, it's rewarded back like with trust um, and loyalty. And so I think a lot of those things have helped us survive through kind of the chaos of the last seven, eight years. Yeah. Lots to lots of different things we could get into there, but maybe, maybe one way to do it would be, let's talk for a minute about SVB because it was a uh, relatively recent yeah. on your list of perpetual crises. That one is relatively recent. So you just yeah. had, big accounts there and you had lines of credit there, right? Like the whole thing, you guys were fully exposed to SVB. We were, we were a hundred percent banked with SVB. Yeah. And, you know, we got wind that something was up Thursday, late afternoon, mid to late afternoon. Um, so not super early in the grand scheme of things. Like obviously we saw the stock falling Thursday, late morning, but didn't think too much about it, which in, in hindsight was a mistake, but we're like, well, the stock's falling. Like, you know, that to go from stock falling to bank run was not, you know, that was not a synapse in my brain. Um, and what, you know, what I heard in hindsight is like, if you didn't act before 11 AM on Thursday, it was too late anyway. So that, that made me feel a little better. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, by the, and you know, the irony of the whole situation that our, our CFO said, which was so apt is like, our strength, kind of our superpower is actually maintaining calm during times of duress and crisis. And like, this was the one situation where panicking actually served people well. 
which was a little bizarre and, and I think was like pretty unique to this situation. But the people that acted selfishly and panicked got their money out and like had a very calm weekend. And that was not us. Um, our, our first reaction was actually the opposite. It was like, we don't want to contribute to the panic. Like that is not who we are as leaders. That's not, you know, what the, the role we want to play in this. Um, and so we, we chose to try to take out some percentage of our money, not all of it. And at the end of the day, we weren't even able to do that. Like not, nothing crossed by Friday morning. Um, and so, you know, the, the bank got taken over by the FDIC and we basically had no money. Um, and, you know, what, what was very fortunate for us is we bill our customers on a weekly basis um, and we were collecting revenue on Monday and we were not running payroll until later the following week. And, and on Friday, late morning, we realized that and we very quickly set up a bank account with an upstart kind of fintech company where you could open a bank account in minutes and redirected our receivables from SVB's website to, to that company. And that was before SVB's website went down. So we did that pretty early Friday. That was very fortuitous. Um, I guess in the, in the, at the end of the day, it actually didn't matter, but that was probably the best kind of early strategic move we made. And then over the next, I mean, I was on the phone with our investors kind of nonstop over the weekend and our executive team, but basically over the next 48 hours, we put together a, a totally revised operating plan to operate the business with no external capital for as long as humanly possible without laying anyone off. And, and so that meant, you know, what were the expenses we could delay? What were the expenses we could not incur? How could we build much higher margin menus in the short term? Like things that would be hugely punitive in the medium to long term, but it was, it was about survival. And like, how long can we survive without bringing in, you know, with, without access to any of the money that we have um, in the event that something terrible happens and the bank doesn't get rescued? We were, we were really planning for the worst. Uh, and as part of that, we're like, well, let's go secure a bridge loan from our investors, <laughs> um, which we did. We secured a bridge loan. And, and what I had done was my hope was to get that contractually committed uh, in advance on Monday morning before the news would break. And so we got all the, the written commitments by Sunday late afternoon, and this would have bought us several more months. So like we, we essentially would have been able to survive for like four to six months without access to our money. Um, and then by Sunday, it was like 515 Central it was done. That was it. You know, it was like the safest place to have our money was SVB. And, and we put that whole plan on the shelf. And then Monday morning, we have, we have a weekly all company stand up every Monday morning, got up and just shared a much longer version of what I just shared with you with the whole team. And the, the line of credit that you, or the additional funding that you raised in, in record time, whatever, in a day and a half, was that just from all yeah. your existing investors? It was. Yeah. And what were, what were your like big venture investors talking about that weekend? I'm super curious. Were they like in freak out mode too, or what, what was their mood? Um, really depended on the investor. Uh, people were, you know, there was a lot of trafficking of gossip over the course of the 48 hours of like what people were hearing, which banks were getting involved, you know, um, we taught, you know, where, where we could, uh, actually find liquidity. And, you know, there were, there were some shops popping up that were willing to buy some of the, the unsecured capital in advance. Um, so we had some investors suggest we should do that. We, did, we didn't do that. Fortunately, they were, you know, obviously not paying a hundred cents on the dollar for that. Um, not our investors, other, other firms. Um, yeah, you know, I think they were, they were mainly urging us to just like fi find a way to survive. Um, and, and traffic, trafficking in knowledge and, and gossip and things like that and um, doing their best to support. Lo lots of introductions, I would say, was like the biggest thing, like trying to help us get bank accounts set up. That was another thing, like trying to get a bank account set up before Monday morning was hard, like everyone was trying to do that. So pulling strings to help us at a big bank, pulling strings yeah, to help make that happen. Where did you end up moving to? Um, so we have an account with JP Morgan now. Um, but the bulk of our money is still with, you know, the bank that was formerly known as SVB. I see. Um, and, you know, since the acquisition, like things have transitioned pretty smoothly and, and we're pretty comfortable with, you know, we don't have as much money with them as we used to. We, we do have some diversification, but there that's where we're holding the, the bulk of our money. Yeah, that must have been a crazy weekend. I, rem I remember just like reading the chatter on Twitter and like people were talking about how like this was like an extinction 
moment for every venture yeah. venture back company in the country. And like, I knew once you started to do the logic on it, I knew they weren't gonna they yeah. weren't gonna let the depositors just go out. There was just way too much at risk for the economy. And it, was, it didn't make sense. Yeah. It didn't make sense. Like the only way I think that would have happened was if politics won the day, which would have been really sad and like ultimately would have been really punitive to, you know, the Biden administration if they had gone down the path of letting the bank fail. But, you know, where where I was hoping everyone saw was like certainly there's some, I think, like emblematic Silicon Valley backed companies or venture firms that you know, maybe didn't deserve all the money that they got and had inflated valuations and were not contributing to kind of the, the real economy of the U.S. But I don't think that's the story of a lot of the companies that banked with SVB. And ours was a very good representative example. Like we produce hundreds of thousands of meals every week. We work with small businesses all across the country to procure packaging and ice and insulation and, uh, you know, get our stuff printed and um, work with all kinds of temp agencies. Like we probably have hundreds of different vendors and suppliers and partners that we work with, the bulk of whom are like small to medium-sized businesses across the U.S. And you, it's not a hard exercise to be like, okay, if Tavala can't pay uh, all of their vendors and suppliers, then those vendors and suppliers ultimately can't pay their people. And like, it's not a long journey to be like, okay, enough of these companies go under overnight, the economy will fall into a deep recession very quickly. Yeah, I totally agree. It's like, there, there is a political environment where they would let SVB go out and, and yeah. do it. Yeah. And we, we aren't there yet. Like had, you know, maybe like some of the, the cities where the, the politics have really, you know, gotten radical. If they were in charge, maybe mm-hmm. just to make an example of these capitalists, yeah. maybe, maybe they would have let it fail. But yeah, and we, we were preparing for the worst, even though we didn't think it would happen. We're like, oh, the odds of this thing going under are very, like truly letting the bank fail are really low. But if it happens, like, let's have a plan. Fascinating. Um, what's the environment right now in venture? I know venture was basically already in big trouble before this <laughs> happened. So what, what's the environment today? And uh, what do you, what's your prognosis for the future? Yeah, I, you know, it's a little bit stage dependent, but I think the kind of big picture view right now is, it's a really quiet time. Most investors are focused on their own portfolio and trying to do whatever they can to extend runway in their portfolio companies and for the companies that can get to profitability and you know live without external capital, doing everything they can to support those companies in, in getting to that piece. Um, there's still a ton of dry powder is the reality. Like these funds raised record or these investors raised like record size funds in 2021 and like the beginning of 2022. And it takes a while to deploy all that money and deployment has been really slow the last 12 months. So at some point that money will get deployed. I think the uncertainty has to kind of really die down. And now there's just so much uncertainty around the macro environment, you know, what's going to happen with the economy, what are fair prices? Nobody wants to price anything because they just, no one knows like what is a fair price for a company because multiples have changed so dramatically in such a short period of time. Um, that it is, it is a very quiet time. Like that, especially in our space, like late stage growth companies, there's not a ton of activity, and the bulk of the activity is uh, from insiders. Um, you know, there's we've also been hearing there's a ton of companies raising at lowered valuations, which makes sense. Like the the public markets have come down so much that things are going to get repriced in the private markets too, especially companies that raised at like peak froth. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a very different time than what we were operating in for the last like 10, 12 years. And, and a lot of our investors only have seen bull, bull times. Like, you know, it's been a long time since we've been in a true bear market in the venture space. Yeah, like the last one was what, after the tech wreck in the early 2000s? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like, I, you know, there was probably some of it post-financial crash in the late 2000s, but I think like long extended bear market in venture was probably early 2000s. Yeah, and, and the... the from my observation, just as an outsider, I'm not, I'm not really a technology investor, um, but I do keep track of the space. It seemed like the, the valuations were nutty to begin with. And then mm-hmm. COVID and the crypto bubble or whatever that was really made them even nuttier. Like people, the SPAC thing happened, like there was just money everywhere. And the valuation was like imaginary, right? Like 100x revenue yeah. or maybe even more than that in some right. cases, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially for 
SaaS companies, like 100 to 200x revenue multiples were common, which is crazy to me. Like we've never come, you know, within miles and miles of that kind of multiple and, and we have a significant size revenue base. Um, but yeah, the valuations were insane. You know, and these are companies that like, you know, if, if a business is ultimately valued on its free cash flow, like these companies were so far away from ever generating cash flow that it, you know, didn't make sense in hindsight. Yeah, it's, it's like we, we work as a, everyone picks on WeWork, but it's a good example of how nutty it got, right? Like we work, IPO'd or was about to IPO at some crazy number, like and then it ended yeah, up 50 billion. 50 and then it, what did it do? Five billion or something like that? Like five to ten. Yeah, it was yeah. down whatever, 80, 90 percent. Like that's what can happen if you and these are, you know, like like in the case of the FTX debacle, like the investors who invested in FTX were like some of the best names and people in the world, right? I mean Yeah. So Crazy. Everyone got caught up in it, in it, in some sense. I think, or not everyone, but investors yeah. did. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. It's like so obvious in hindsight, but when you're in it, it's not. But it sounds like you think the um, the prognosis is probably positive for venture because just just on the raw fact that they've raised all this money that they they have control of. Yeah, I th- I think eventually things will normalize. Like, you know, there were also so many new funds that grew, like or were sprouted in the last three, four years, a lot of those won't survive is the reality. Like they won't have really successful funds to show, you know, if like the bulk of when you deployed capital was 2020 and 2021, like you deployed at really high prices. It will take a lot for those, those funds to return, you know, what they were promising to their investors. Um, so I think there will be probably some consolidation and like fewer funds when we're on the other end of this, but uh, I don't think like by any means the industry is going away. I think there will be, you know, it will come back in terms of a lot of this capital will have to be deployed. Um, just a matter of when And I'm, I'm not in the prognosticating game. I feel like people have been saying we're six to 12 months away from a recession or recovery for the last year. Uh, and it just keeps getting pushed out. So who knows? Yeah. It's smart, smart to stay out of that game. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, I can't control it. Yeah, you know? that's for sure. And the, you're interesting. Uh, your story is also interesting too. We didn't touch on this earlier because you started this company in Chicago, so pretty far away from Silicon Valley. So, what, what's the what's right. the venture or startup scene like in Chicago, and does does the future look positive there as well? Yeah, it was a deliberate decision. We we spent some time in Silicon Valley. We went through Y Combinator and then decided to move back to Chicago. I I personally felt like we would have a huge advantage from a talent acquisition and retention standpoint in Chicago and really be able to stand out as a pretty unique kind of big vision business in a way that we would have struggled in the Bay. And and I think that was true. Like I think we were able to win from a talent standpoint and where it was harder was raising money. Uh, I think we would have raised more money at high, much higher prices in the Bay. But that actually might have been a bad thing in hindsight. Um, we might have raised too much too early, burned it before we found product market fit, um, or raised the prices that were too high and you know had a hard time kind of growing into those valuations. And we saw that with some of our peers that I think probably raised too much and you know ultimately spelled doom for their businesses. So even though it was harder, um, at the end of the day, I think it was it was probably beneficial. And you know, our later rounds did end up coming from from both coasts. Like we've raised more from the East Coast than the West Coast, but we did end up raising some money from West Coast funds later on. Um, and, you know, generally have felt good about building the business here. Like Chicago is very central to the country. It's why so many food companies are based here. Uh, companies that have been around for decades or centuries. Like it's very logistically, this is an amazing hub to hit most of the U.S. And so that was, that's been really beneficial for us from a food distribution standpoint and our margins. Um, and the ecosystem has grown a lot since we started there, there is a lot more capital here, especially in the early stages than there was when we started, when there were just a handful of funds and, you know, a few notable angel investors. That's interesting. I, a few days ago, I, I interviewed, a sort of a senior partner at McKinsey, a longtime McKinsey partner, who's really astute mm-hmm. on just like the trends and all the stuff happening in the world. And, and, uh, her hypothesis was that. There's going the, the future is going to evolve in a direction where there's there's not like one or two Silicon Valleys. There's a whole bunch of them because this what we've learned about the ecosystems that develop is that they're so positive and so self reinforcing that you just got to get them going, and then all of a sudden it's like the leading edge of that city. 
and it, I think we're seeing it now. Like and Miami's taking off, Chicago's obviously doing well, and Austin is there. Yeah. Like it's, I think, I think it's an interesting point and probably true. What's hard? What you know? One of the things that was really unique about Silicon Valley still is is it kind of feeds on itself. So like they had so many successful companies and those com- you know, the, the, like the monster successes, right? The Googles, the Facebooks, Yahoo's, like those companies minted thousands and thousands of millionaires, tens of thousands. And those millionaires put their money back into the ecosystem. Like all those millionaires became angel investors and the angel investors created this amazing community where they'd invest in er- really early stage concepts. And that's like super critical both financially and like mentorship and all those things, like that's I, to me is like a really critical piece that is maybe the hardest to replicate. Like, how do you get multiple billion or multi billion dollar exits in an ecosystem that creates not not just the you know the super 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 rich of like the the executive teams and board members and investors, but like the next layer of early employees that can become contributors to an early stage startup ecosystem. That's a really hard thing to do, and it takes time. Um, and I think that's one of the places where Silicon Valley just won. And then it, it breeds on itself. It's like, well, there's money there, so more people want to go there. And then when there's more people there, you're going to mint more big companies and just built and built and built. Yeah, you know, that's such a good point, though, because the other thing, that, the other truth about that is that if you make money that way, like if you make your wealth through technology, it's much yeah. easier for you to sit across a table from a young entrepreneur who's like, hey, this is invest in my $10 million pre-money valuation. Right. right, right. Totally. 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 Versus, you know, here, for better or for worse, like many of the angel investors I met early on were people that made their money trading stocks and derivatives and things like that, where like they're risk takers, but in a different way. And so, you know, like there is a more conservative approach to investing in early stage technology companies than there is in the Valley, which makes it harder makes it harder but it's kind of like a from an investor standpoint it it takes a huge mental shift but it's kind of a superpower if you can do it if you can kind of suspend your disbelief for a second you can you can get access to deals that will have returns that could be like miles ahead of what you do even if you're a prudent real estate investor you know you can earn 15 in real estate but you could earn 1500 percent in in yeah you you need you need to be like a crazy optimist to be a successful early stage investor because there's a thousand ways to say no and like reasons why a business won't work at that stage. Yeah. And like, there's probably two reasons why it will. And you have, you have to believe enough to like bet on the two reasons. Right. Fascinating. Well, just, I have just a couple more questions for you. Thanks. Thanks for your time. So you mentioned, yeah. we were talking earlier about sort of the crisis, perpetual crisis mode. And, and you mentioned that you learned a lot about yourself and your leadership and that your style maybe you know the one of the advantages of your leadership style was this trust base and and transparency but what what else have you learned like what are some good leadership lessons that you've taken away and and can share with with this audience um it's a good question um you know one one is probably tied to trust like i've actually never struggled to delegate and what, you know, what that allowed me to do was for me to scale and for the people that worked for me to take on more and more responsibility and like enjoy a lot of personal growth, uh, and, and recognize that they had my trust out of the gates. And I think it's one of the reasons why we were able to do, you know, a lot with a little, like build a really complex business ultimately came down to our ability to hire people that wanted a lot of responsibility and autonomy and, and my co-founder and like executive team's willingness to delegate a lot of significant responsibility and decision-making authority to earlier employees. And, and we've tried to maintain that spirit of autonomy and delegation because uh, we, we think it's really empowering for people and really helps us scale um, and, you know, retain happy employees. Uh, you know, another thing for me, like I, I am conflict averse and think I'm a, I'm a very kind person. And so we had an exceedingly kind, we still do exceedingly kind culture. Like people treat each other really well. And I, I have always felt like a huge sense of responsibility for the people that come to work here to do what's best for them and have tried for, for that to like come through in my actions, my words, 
the decisions we make as a company to actually put our, our team's best interests ahead of necessarily, you know, what might be best for our investors or even for the company sometimes when it's like, I, I have a decision to make between what's best for the individual versus the company. Like I often try to put on my, what is best for the individual hat because they, they gave us and me like a part of their lives and a ton of trust and work and all those things. Um, so anyway, these things are tied, like the, the kindness thing, I think is part of what separates our culture and has made people really happy to work here. But, you know, all, all of our strengths as people uh, in overuse are weaknesses. And that was one that manifested over time where we developed a fairly conflict averse culture and a feedback averse culture where, where people didn't want to hurt people's feelings. And because it was this really kind culture and everyone was so good to each other and really cared for the human being it was hard to give critical feedback. And it started with me. Like that was, that was a true weakness of mine, not something I was good at, not something I'd been taught. And so it's something we've had to really develop as an organization. And, you know, one of the interesting insights, which you know, might come across as uh, egotistical, but it's a, for better or worse, true, I think of every startup is the culture of the startup is a manifestation of the personalities of the founders. Um, it just happens that way. And, you know, over time, it definitely evolves and some of the stronger leaders will help shape it a little bit. But if you really kind of dig under the surface, what is the culture of the company is who are the founders and how do they operate as human beings? Um, and, and that was one of my flaws that had become like truly endemic in the organization and was causing a lot of problems. And so, you know, we're definitely not all the way there. Like, I think we still have a lot to go to get to where we want to be, but building a culture of you know, more direct feedback, open feedback, open conflict without losing the sense of kindness and trust has been a very deliberate goal of ours for the last probably 12 months, 15 months. Um, and I think it was a really good example of just learning that came through the journey. How did you come to the realization that, that, was, that this was impacting, you know, your culture and your leadership style? Like, how did you realize, oh, man, I'm way too averse to conflict and I'm not giving the kind of feedback I need to give? Yeah, it, it wasn't necessarily one aha moment. It was a lot of different things. Like I've done multiple 360s on myself. We've done culture surveys with the organization. We have some people here that are wired the exact opposite that, you know, would be like, this is so weird. Like, why can't we, why don't people say these things? You know, wh why do we have to give feedback behind closed doors? And why does it have to be hush hush? And like, we don't talk about the elephants in the room. So it was all these data points that were starting to spring up. And I didn't know exactly what to do with it. And we hired an amazing chief people officer that joined us about 14, 15 months ago that has really helped like operationalize a lot of these like more ambiguous challenges. Like how do you, how do you make a culture more feedback, uh, more open to feedback, more direct? Um, and, you know, how does she, you know, she's helped coach me, you know, gotten feedback from others. I had a coach that was helping me like, um, it's, it's been a journey and it's, it's not something that you can just like identify. Like you actually have to build a plan to go solve it in a way that you would tackle like margin improvement or CAC improvement or something like that. So you can find us at, uh, Tavala.com. Uh, you can come and purchase our ovens and, and our meal plans and on social at, uh, Tavala food, whether on Instagram or Twitter or wherever you want to look, but Tavala.com is your best source. Thank you for listening to the Nicolera show. We hope you enjoyed the episode and would appreciate your help with spreading the word by sharing with your network on social. And until next time, remember, it's not about pursuing success to unlock fulfillment. It's about learning how to find fulfillment in the midst of success.